Hello everyone, welcome back to OC Recovery's YouTube channel. Before I go any further, as I say in the beginning of every video, if you could please subscribe down below, lots of videos going up. I said this now in the last four or five videos, what we're doing is you can DM Rob or Momin or me on my height. Uh, you see me comment on Rob's uh, a guy who hikes. So DM me, ask me about questions that you would like to see answered more about. Usually it comes down to how to apply acceptance, why acceptance is an agreement, uh, different stages of the recovery process and stuff like that. So I've done a couple of videos so far breaking down exercises in the first book on the reading list. How to Stubbornly Refuse to Make Yourself Miserable About Anything. Yes, anything by the founder of Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, which was REBT in 1955. So I'm going to talk about the first chapter which is called why is, the, why is This Book Different from Other Self-Help Books? And then I'm going to talk about the first exercise in can you really refuse to make yourself miserable about anything and why acceptance does not mean agreement and why, you know, you don't have to enjoy the situation you're in, but you can work on accepting it as a whole unconditionally. So why is this book different from other self-help books? So there's a bunch of basically lists here on this couple pages that goes about talking about why these books are different than basically the repackaged and reframe hundreds, if not thousands of traditional self-help books out there. So it's not that the traditional self-help books have no merit whatsoever, but they're very surface level. They talk about, and when this isn't just OCD related, this is about anything. They talk about, you know, the surface level. They don't look at the core fears. They don't look at your belief system. They make it out to be fairy tale like They say stuff like, oh, well, just don't listen to your mom and stuff like that. And very surface level stuff that the reality doesn't actually get you anywhere. And I've done a great video called why people are what I like to call insight gatherers. You see this in all fields of, of everything. People will just gather insight, gather insight. And then what happens is they don't do anything with that insight. This is why Dr. Albert Ellis's book is so different because when you look at a cognitive aspect of something, there also needs to be more than likely a behavioral change. So a lot of people just gather insight. They have insight into their problems, but then they actually don't change their behavior. And there's a couple reasons for that. As I tell everyone that has OCD problems or not, excuse me, uh, handling discomfort is a major reason why people don't go anywhere. Why Rob and I talked about this in our last IG Live. So let's see. The number one thing, okay, about with this book, it shows you how to cope with difficult life situations and how to feel better when you are faced with them. But more important, much more important, it demonstrates how you can get better as well as feel better when you need, needlessly uh, basically, basically make yourself neurotic. So in the entire book, he goes down the breakdown why. So we have the A, B, C's and we have G's. So we have G's and goals in life. That could be anything in life. To live a reasonably happy, content life and with little suffering. Okay, that's a good goal for most people. Then we have activating events, which would say developing OCD. And then we have a belief that everyone forgets about. And then we have a C. We have an emotional consequence. So a lot of the general therapeutic responses in psychology look at stuff thinking that the primary event, the activating event, is the cause of your emotional disturbance. Now, in our IG Live the other day, I broke down why that's not true from Dr. Albert Ellis. When you look at, say, the belief system, the structured belief system, if you look at, say, Man's Search for Meaning, which is on the reading list by Dr. Viktor Frankl, why was his experience so much different in Auschwitz than, say, other people in documentaries I watched who had severe PTSD and stuff like that? They all went to the same activating event. They were still at Auschwitz and concentration camp. All their family members got murdered and all this crazy stuff happened. I should go like that. That's yeah, a little better. So, but that is the major thing. It's the belief system you hold right now. Now, the reason why a lot of people will skip over this type of work or Ellis's work is because they think it's another tool to use. No, rational mode of behavioral therapy is not just some tool. It's a way of seeing life from a stoic perspective, okay? Seeing life from a Greco-Roman philosophy perspective, looking at life in its basis sense for what it is. We are humans floating on the rock. There's no such thing as good and bad. Only thinking makes it so, which is a great uh, quote. I can't remember by, if it's by Marcus Aurelius or Plato. It actually might be in the beginning of this book, to be completely honest, but I don't think it is. Let's see. So, no, I don't think so. Uh, uh, um... But yeah, that's a, a super, super, super important thing to realize because 
our thinking and our belief system. This doesn't mean that you can't be suffering. You could be chronically suffering and not be affected by it nearly like you would be if you attached a belief that this must not happen to me. My life must be a certain way. That's where people get hung up and caught. So let's see if there's anything else on this page that I want to talk about. No. So can you really refuse to make yourself miserable about anything? Yes, anything. That is a very grasp. A very just arduous task if you look at it. But yes, you can. You can refuse to make most things in your life, if not all things in your life, not affect you with the unhealthy emotions such as chronic anxiety, chronic shame, chronic guilt. Now, there's a lot of people out there who study shame and, and, and guilt. And a lot of their points have great truth behind them. But the reality is, the one thing almost all shame and guilt researchers are missing is this. If you have unconditional self-life and other acceptance, if you've adopted those philosophies, it's not saying that you will not like, you have to like everything that you do, but because you unconditionally accept yourself and life, it will not lead to chronic shame or guilt. That knocks PTSD completely off the blocks and it has no framework because you could be in a Humvee accident and everyone dies and you live not saying you enjoy that whatsoever, but if you look at it from the lens of unconditional self-life and other acceptance, you can accept yourself as a fallible human, wrong place, wrong time, whatever you want to think about it like that. And that's just happened in life. You don't have to enjoy it, but it doesn't have to lead to chronic shame and guilt. This is the core fear because we hear a lot of stuff where people say, oh, I'm treatment resistant, PTSD, OCD, GAD, more than likely no such thing. It's just the fear hasn't been realized yet and you haven't worked on it long enough yet to get underneath this. It took me almost two years to get to this point. I mean, think about that. It won't take everyone two years, but it took me two years. Okay, let's go to the exercise because people really like that. Exercise number one. At first, the following exercise seems very simple but it is not quite as easy as it appears. It gives you practice at distinguishing between your healthy and your unhealthy negative feelings. When you view something in your life as unfortunate or when you're concerned about a bad event occurring. So in life, let's use all of us for example, we have OCD. Every single one of us has OCD. There is nothing you can do to make the genetic component of OCD, because it is more than likely genetic, go away. But you can recover to where there's the absence of chronic anxiety, shame, and guilt, and you can't really tell that you have OCD. That is super important to talk about because there are a lot of people that's like, oh, uh, recovery is managing, recovery for me is managing symptoms. No, recovery is not subjective to the person. Recovery has a basic definition. It means the absence of chronic anxiety, shame, and guilt. You can get there with correct work, practice, and certainty exposures in developing this stuff. So distinguishing between healthy concern Caution, vigilance, and unhealthy anxiety, nervous system panic. So panic and chronic anxiety is never warranted when you get underneath them by looking at your core fears. Now, this doesn't happen in two weeks. It doesn't happen in a couple months. It's going to take some time to really see this. Many exposures, many life events that you start to look at through a rational lens. Imagine an unfortunate thing that has happened to you or might happen to you soon, such as losing a good job, being hurt in an accident, or losing a loved one. Let's say getting cancer. Let's go to the... Um, the health OCD people out there. Let's say stage four cancer or going blind or something, okay? Vividly imagine this event may easily occur, okay? I'm gonna go to the doctors and three hours from now and I'm gonna get diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. Same cancer my dad had, uh, and which killed him in seven months. How do you feel? What are you telling yourself in order to create this feeling? So now, if I got diagnosed with cancer right now, can't say for sure, but I'm pretty sure it wouldn't affect me that much. Uh, I've had a great life. I've had many things in life. I've got a doctoral degree. I've got to help people in the OC community. Uh, I have a business with my wonderful wife. I have two, jo uh, two jobs. Two do I have two jobs, but I have two dogs. Um, I have a great family. I had great time with my father. I look at things in a rational sense, and that has helped me tremendously. If you feel healthy concern or caution, you're telling yourself something such as, I certainly wouldn't like this unfortunate thing to happen, but if it does, I can handle it. That's the key in all the fears. That is fear of fear, fear of being stuck forever with somatic OCD, fear of going near a school for POCD, fear of hurting your children, fear of all the, the really hard ones, solipsism, being in a, a um, simulation, all existential OCD. I wouldn't like having stage four cancer. I'm not gonna sit here and say, oh, having stage four cancer would be 
would be the best. But there are some things I could learn from stage four cancer. I could help other people, maybe who are also, you know, have unhealthy lifestyle factors. I'm like, hey, look, you don't want to end up like me, even though you're never guaranteed anything. You could be very healthy and still get cancer. I know a lot of people that's happened to. Um, my buddy was 27, got lung cancer, never smoked in his life. So it's not as simple as trying to agree and trying to prove to yourself that it won't happen. A lot of people will try to prove to themselves like, oh, well, I have good vitals. I have all the right things in my life that brings down my chances of having cancer. That's not going to work. That's not going to unlatch it because OCD will say something like, because you can always Google like my buddy. Well, this kid got cancer at 27. He didn't even smoke her. He was healthy. It will always work around this. You have to have unconditional self-life and other acceptance. So this is really, oh, they even talk about sight here. If I lost my sight, that would be exceptionally handicapping, but I could still have a get, uh, very good enjoyment. A good exposure, I just was talking to someone about this. I watched a video um, or, or read something about people who were blind and they asked them, oh, how tough it was. You should have heard some of these answers. Someone was like, it's amazing. It's like the best thing that ever happened to me. I no longer have the materialistic needs and cares that I once had. That's a really cool perspective. I'm not saying it's an easy perspective to get, but you can get there. So if you feel unhealthy, unhealthily anxious, nervous, or panic, look for these kinds of musts, necessities, awfulizing, I can't stand it itis, self-downing, and overgeneralization. Albert Ellis realized that humans are fallible. We make mistakes. As I always say, and my wife said beautifully, cancel culture is a symptom of low frustration tolerance. You don't have to like what someone did, but you don't have to cut them off forever. That doesn't get us anywhere. That, that all that does is do long-term avoidance. Even the worst scenario you could imagine, okay? Having someone murder your child. Let's say that. That's a pretty tough one for people to grasp. Killing your kid, manslaughter. You have a couple options here, okay? You can work at rationally thinking, that they made a mistake, they're a human, you do not have to like it. You do not have to like that. People will say to me, that's ridiculous, you could never actually do that. Well, that's not true, because there are people that have done it. There, I watched a documentary where a mother and a father were pen pals and visited the, 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 the girl who murdered their son, who choked him to death, and they became friends with them. And even the father actually said, that phone's ringing for the business, even the father actually said, it doesn't even matter if she is faking. It's just super, super, super important. So it's, it's important to talk about that because again, acceptance doesn't mean agreement. So if I lost my job as I must not, okay? If I lost my loved one as I must not, ROCD, I could never get a good one again. And that would show what a wholly incompetent person I am. I must have a guarantee that my mate will not leave me or die. For if he does or she does, I couldn't stand being alone and I would always be miserable. It is absolutely necessary that I not lose my sight for this example. And if I did, my life would be awful and horrible. Now, it is important to look at other people and see that, well, that person is not reacting in, in my way. You do have a disorder. We know that. Kirsty talked about this, looking at other people who have certain things, you know, like I don't have ROCD with anything like that. Might have it one day. Don't have it now. Don't have any fears about that. So Kirsty could look at me and say, well, how does Nick look at that? But that can't be enough for most people because most people will need to accept the worst case scenario. This is a part of the journey, but it's not the entire journey. Okay. If you feel depressed, Look for your shoulds, oughts, and musts like these. I should have been more careful with my money. What a fool I was for not being more cautious. My boss ought not criticize me like that. I can't bear that time, type of continual criticism. So let's talk about that for a second. I haven't really spoken on uh, MDD, major depressive disorder, or depression yet. Highly misunderstood, and advice is highly wrong. So we have what, what people will call the chemical imbalance theory, okay? We know that this isn't true. Uh, for most people, because they take stuff and then they don't get better. More than likely is happening in the research and what we see is highly depressed people on average have much more irrational beliefs than other people. We have seen people, anecdotally, people have gotten much better from severe depression. It doesn't matter if it's caused, if OCD causes depression or depression causes OCD, that is a dead end. Don't even try to figure that out. What matters is this. If you have depressive states, or if you're highly depressed, you more than likely will need to look at the belief you have, and it usually comes down to unconditional self and primarily unconditional life acceptance. 
Many people have conditions on their life. So they have stuff, they say stuff like, this should never have happened to me. My life must not have been this way. There's no universal law. You don't have to like it. It's not about liking OCD, but it is about realizing that it is not the end of the world. This is super important. This book right here. I mean, listen, you can do what you want. Um, there are a lot of other great books out there in their community, but the books are on the reading list for a reason because they help teach you the foundation of how to apply unconditional self life mother acceptance, excuse me, how to move with uncertainty, how to handle anxiety. The beliefs we hold, the B, as Dr. Albert Ellis has laid out in the foundation of REBT, went with the CBT, is that the belief is the primary reason why you are staying stuck. And I always use the example. If 100 people get into a motor vehicle accident, not all 100 people are going to act the same way. It doesn't even matter if it was the same angle to the exact centimeter in everything. Some people will be happy to get a new car from insurance. Some people will be miserable because it's all about, it's all about the belief they hold right now. That is the primary driver. It's not saying the acting of bidding event doesn't matter. You can't go to someone who's been in Auschwitz and say to them, the belief on Auschwitz is the only reason why you're unhappy. That's not a realistic thing. You know, look, you in Auschwitz, Dr. Victor Frankl, I was in Auschwitz. I watched everyone die. My whole family died. Everyone I know died. What am I going to do? Am I going to sit here and brew over and be depressed for the rest of my life? Or am I going to change my belief in the moment and get forward? That is huge. Same thing. Laid out, how to stubbornly refuse to make yourself miserable about anything, yes, anything. Thank you so much for watching and have a great day.